Uh, G'day everyone. Um, I can see Suman that you're present um, and it's just gone 10 o'clock my time uh, which is one o'clock uh, in Pacific Standard Time and depending on where you're joining in from around the world. Uh, welcome uh, Renee um, and welcome Rob. Uh, if while we're waiting for other people to log in and join us um, I'm just going to send out uh, a quick poll for people to complete. Uh, so if you can click the appropriate answer as to where you are attending from. You can see there's people from New Zealand, a uh, couple of people from UK. Um, I think, uh, Renee, you're a Kiwi in the UK. Uh, if that's correct, just uh, feel free to uh, type a quick note in the question box and I'll be able to pick up on that. Uh, I've got other people uh, jumping online at the moment as well. Hey, hi Suman, thanks for touching base there. Uh, welcome Koshik, if I've pronounced that correctly. Hey, glad you can join us there, uh, Renee. And yeah, couple from London, or couple from the UK, sorry. Uh, and Aussie as well. Uh, so welcome to our Australian colleagues from across the ditch. Um, I'm obviously New Zealand based. Um, we'll just give people a few more minutes to join on. I usually start these at 10 or log in at 10 for a uh, and start at about three or four minutes past. So just if you, when you join in, uh, if you can complete the poll and we'll get into things shortly. Hope everyone's having a great day wherever it is uh, in the world you are. Um, is it, Rob, are you New Zealand based? Feel free to drop something in the question uh, box just to let me know whereabouts uh, in New Zealand you are based. In fact, that is you that is New Zealand based. Uh, same for our Australian who has joined us. Just feel free to say g'day in the question box and say whereabouts you're from, what part of Aussie. Okay, let's um, close that poll down. Um, been having some technical issues this morning as well. Um, just with uh, so I'm actually operating off my laptop instead of desktop. So things are a little bit different from normal for me. And also down in my office, and I've got a washing machine and the laundry outside, so my office at home is in our basement. Okay, so uh, we're here because you're wanting to find out how to run your best half marathon in 2019. I'm gonna go over a few things with you today. Um, primarily about how to set training intensities to get the most out of your training, but also how to structure your training to get your best result. Uh, if, if you've got any questions, feel free to type them into the question box as we go. I will. I've been coaching professionally since 2000. Uh, step what was Ray's Independent Fitness Consultants back in February of 2000. And a couple of years later, I started using the Quick Kiwi Coaching um, branding and have incorporated that as a company in 2007. Uh, Specialised in coaching recreational and beginner athletes, and I've helped um, plenty of people finish both half and full marathons, as well as well as other events, triathlons, uh, cycling events, uh, etc. I don't just coach anyone, I closely uh, look 
at the people I coach with and have a good discussion with them to make sure that we're going to be a good fit uh, coach to athlete relationship. If I'm not going to be a good fit as a coach for them, then I don't work with them. And if they're not going to fit um, my coaching style or the uh, team that we have, uh, then I, I don't work with them either. I like to make sure that athletes are success driven and will get the success that they deserve. As an athlete, I've done a large number of marathons and half marathons around New Zealand, including doing the Rotorua Marathon 12 times. Um, I'm a former junior half marathon champion from back in 1996. I've got a marathon PB of one hour 22 minutes and a marathon PB of three hours, zero minutes and 20 seconds. That was a, a frustrating day down in Dunedin in 2014. Um, where I shouldn't have got close to the three hour barrier um, but gave myself a bit of a pep talk at about the 27k mark and said sort yourself out right let's get going and got a lot closer than I ever should have. Uh, there's me and my partner on a run up in Nelson Lakes, uh, beautiful day up there, um, that photo is a couple of years old now actually. Um, I need to get a, a more updated photo of us out doing something together. There's me with my daughter as well out in the hills. Once again, I probably need to update that, get something a little bit more recent. Uh, and there's me competing. Um, that one is actually um, Wellington anniversary day was yesterday, uh, not yesterday, start of the week. Uh, so the anniversary of that race um, was actually yesterday uh, from 2016, the Wellington Half Ironman, which was held on Wellington anniversary day a couple of years ago, three years ago, four years ago, 2014 maybe, 2015. Anyway, I can't remember. It was a few years ago now. Uh, before we get into things, here's um, some comments from one of the athletes I've been working with uh, for a while, Di Chisma, uh, and she says, I've been using Quick Kiwi since 2006 to take the guesswork out of the training I need to do for a variety of events. Personalised training program from Quick Kiwi Coach Ray features many of the workouts he publishes in Coach Ray slash Quick Kiwi blog. They've been successful in getting me to the start line of many events of various lengths and disciplines, triathlon, duathlon, cycling, short and long distances, time trials, etc., adventure races and running events. These days she focuses on the half marathon. Uh, the workout's coupled with a personal desire and commitment to achieve are a win-win for me. So moving into to, today's agenda, tonight, um, depending on where in the world you are, how to measure training intensities, how to determine training intensities to maximise your training, and how to prioritise your training for your build-up. And finishing with what type of sessions to include in each phase of training. So getting straight into it, how to measure training intensities, a rating of perceived exertion um, is one option, uh, and that's primarily the Borg scale. And we'll go into all these in a little bit more detail shortly. And there's using heart rate, which everyone's familiar with the fact that um, when you exercise, your heart rate goes up. When you stop exercising, your heart rate goes down. So it's a, uh, a, a reasonable way of assessing intensity, and there's a few limitations to it, however. Same with pace, the time it takes you to run a kilometre or a mile and using that, um, the more effort in, the faster you run. Uh, and also power, measuring in watts, how much effort um, you're doing and how, how fast you're doing that effort. So we'll go into a little bit more detail about um, these four different options and where my preferences are and what most of my athletes end up using. So the rating of perceived exertion, um, it's very subjective is where you think you are and how hard you think you're working. So a 10 for one person is going to be different for a 10 for another person. Uh, it might be that you've got two, two people running, um, one might be the world champion, and one might be uh, an overweight person going for the, um, their third training session. So they might be going along at a, um, a, a moderate pace, of about five minutes per kilometre, and the world champion will probably be down uh, at about the one or two, and the uh, overweight, unfit person might be at their absolute maximal uh, working at their 10. And it's totally subjective, it's where you think you are. Now, when the Borg scale of perceived exertion was first established, it started at six and went up to 20. But in recent, when I say recent years, in the last 30, 40 years, uh, I think it was the late 70s, early 80s, it was modified to a scale from zero through to 10 to simplify it. 
And there's a very good reason why um, Borg, uh, Gunnar Borg, who was a Eastern Bloc sports scientist, developed the system going from six to 20. Um, but it just wasn't intuitive for most people. Uh, so it was modified to zero to 10 and is on the right hand side there. And its biggest limitation is your interpretation of it. What might be a four on one day could be a six or a two on another day, depending on how you are feeling. Moving on to heart rate. It's, heart rate is basically it shows your body's response to the training or the exercise that you're doing. When you work harder, your heart rate goes higher. Um, but the response and how high it will go can be altered due to a number of different things. Stimulants, how well recovered you are from previous training sessions, how well uh, fueled you are, uh, nutrition status, uh, how well hydrated you are, um, how much sleep you've had. There's a whole range of factors that are going to impact your heart rate. So if I was to prescribe a heart rate of 150 beats per minute for a run, um, and that was based off some figures where you'd done a race, uh, where you'd had some coffee beforehand. Um, but on a typical day, you don't drink coffee, then there's going to be a, a disconnect between how I worked out that heart rate intensity and the desired uh, intent for the session, uh, and it's going to be altered. So we're not going to be achieving exactly we want, what we want to achieve unless you do everything the same every single time, uh, which is not really feasible. Um, the other one is using some rough rules of thumb. Some of you have probably heard of the 220 minus your age to calculate your maximum heart rate. That's only true for about 20% of the population. The other 80% of us can be up to 25 beats per minute above or below that. So when you start working out training zones as a percentage of that, then you start um, missing the mark uh, some, sometimes significantly depending on the individual. Using pace, and with uh, particularly with Garmin uh, watches, but also TomTom Tom and um, Nike and Sunto, and there's heaps of brands out there. Um, having a GPS unit on your wrist, you can measure how quickly you're running, reasonably quickly, reasonably accurately, uh, and have it displayed there, and so you can target um, how you do things um, as you go. Um, the the faster you run, the the greater the well, it's an indication of greater effort being put in. The more effort you put in, the faster you end up going. Uh, and it's a direct measure of performance, which is really, really good and what makes it a great training tool. However, it can be impacted significantly by both the terrain uh, and the weather conditions. So if you're running into a block headwind, it's, it's going to slow you down, uh, obviously. Um, but a lot of people will work harder to try and hit the target pace that they're wanting and if you're racing that's exactly what you need to be doing if you're trying to go under three hours for a marathon and you've got the first 28 k's into a massive southerly um, that's going to slow you down um, conversely if you've got the tailwind it's also going to speed you up a little bit if it's hilly it's going to slow you down if it's generally downhill you're going to be able to run at a faster pace slightly easier than what you'd otherwise be be running so you need to bear that in mind with implications with training utilizing pace and finally the new one uh, the new kid on the block is power now not many people are using um, power meters and there's a number available on the market the one in the picture there is the stride uh, power meter and that's what I use for my training it's a nice and convenient tool it clips onto your laces and it provides a reasonably accurate number. There are some limitations and flaws uh, within it, but I find it a lot more um, functional um, than heart rate or RPE and slightly better than using pain. How hard you are working, regardless of uh, the impact of other things in your system, how fatigued you are, um, how hydrated you are, um, any stimulants or lack of stimulants uh, in the system. Um, so it gives a really good indication. Um, in the handout, and I'm not sure if you've got access to the handout yet or not, I've got a link in there with uh, information running with a power meter uh, that I ran, ran 
excuse the pun, I held uh, either early last year, it might have been um, the year before, um, within that to other useful things. But a power meter, similar to cycling, it's measured in watts and gives you a really good um, out measure of how much work you're doing and how fast you are doing it. Before we move on to the next section, um, here's a, another um, review on Facebook from one of my clients, uh, Robert St. Dennis, a Canadian living in New Zealand. And he's, Coach Ray has real dedication to his athletes. Normally, Ray would be online every morning around 5 a.m. analyzing his athletes' data from the day before and usually get feedback that same morning. Very motivating and right there behind you all the way of your training until the eve of your big event. Thanks, Ray. Amazing job. Now, I'm not usually on the uh, online at 5 a.m. every morning. Um, Robert might have believed that by the number of times I would often be up at that hour and, and comment on his training, um, but it's certainly not a daily occurrence. So um, don't don't be misled and expect um, feedback at 5 a.m. every morning, because uh, that's certainly not going to happen. I'm often out doing my own training um, or uh, doing something else at that hour. Um, so I often do start early. I'm an early riser. I'm also early to bed. Um, but the thing is, I do give feedback uh, regularly on athletes' training uh, as long as they log it into the system. So moving on to how to determine training intensities. Um, the intensity you train at is going to determine the physiological effect that's going to occur on the body uh, as a result of, I've put training in there, but it's as a result of recovering from the training that you do. At lower intensities, you're going to improve the efficiency of the heart and lungs. However, it doesn't want to be so low that we get minimal um, um, improvement in the efficiency. And it also needs to be done for long enough. We can't just go for a 10 minute walk and expect massive improvements. It's just not going to happen. We need to hit the appropriate intensity and do it for long enough. And building up the long runs to well over 90 minutes uh, is going to be the key to success for building that up and doing them consistently. One, one a week is sort of the bare minimum uh, that needs to be done. Jumping into too long a run too quickly is going to have a negative impact and likely to get injured. So it does need to be built up progressively. At the higher intensities, you're going to build up your tolerance to lactic acid uh, and develop your ability to clear waste products from the muscles quickly and also build a higher top end speed. So that's what's going to help you run quicker. When we're using pace uh, as our measure of success, and, and this is what the majority, I'd probably say 80% of my athletes use primarily as their key training tool. Uh, in terms of determining uh, intensity. To determine your training zones and the intensity, the average pace for a hard five or 10 kilometers is perfect for setting training intensities. Now, primarily I use Matt Fitzgerald's um, runner's edge charts to determine training intensity. So you look up your race result or your time trial result from 5Ks or 10Ks, uh, and then look across the chart, or I use an online version of it uh, to see how fast you should be running at the different pace zones. Pace zone three is primarily what we're using for our um, for our long runs, for our easier, lower intensity runs. Um, but if we're doing thresholds, uh, intervals, something like that, we'd be looking at pace zone six. And sometimes we do uh, sessions with intervals at pace zone eight as well. So we want to try and maximize the time in the appropriate uh, zone. Also, Jack Daniels with Daniels Running Formula also has very similar charts in his book. Um, or in his books, and they can be just as effective. And to be honest, they're very similar to Matt Fitzgerald's charts. They're just slightly tweaked a little bit, um, but typically there's a fair amount of overlap whether you use Matt Fitzgerald's or Jack Daniels versions. So a good time trial um, or even a 5 or a 10K race is perfect for setting um, training zones using pace. With heart rate, um, it's the base training off the level of intensity that you can sustain. So once again, we'd look at either a half marathon or a 10K race and see what sort of heart rate you can maintain and keep steady state uh, for almost an hour. Um, if using heart rate as your main intensity measure, I typically get people to do a 10K race or a time trial uh, and average the heart rate across that session. Uh, but I don't currently have anyone using heart rate primarily as their measure of an intensity at the moment. Uh, ultra marathon runners tend to be 
the best candidates for using heart rate because they're their terrain, they're such a variety of terrain. It's typically mainly off-road um, and often involves some serious hills. So keeping that heart rate consistent is the key for them. Um, and then zones are calculated based off that average heart rate from the from the time trial or the event. Now using power, um, there's two key uh, functional threshold power tests used for runners uh, measuring power. There's the three and nine minute test, which um, is relatively simple, but I much prefer the 30 minute steady state test. And the reason for that is for anyone running a half marathon, you get a lot better training stimulus out of that test um, by running hard for 30 minutes than you do for running hard for 12 minutes with plenty of walking in between. So it's the training training benefit as opposed to better data. Uh, it's not worse data, it's just on par with each other, those two tests. Um, I'd use the three and the nine minute test for maybe a 1500 meter runner, um, but for 5K and above, I'd use the 30, 30 minute steady state test as the best gauge. And as I've stated there on the, the slide, for half marathons, I use the 30 minute steady, tape, steady state test uh, exclusively. And I use that one on myself as well. And there's a link through to details of that test uh, in the handout for the webinar as well. Okay, so Sheila, uh, another client of mine. Um, this is a review she put up um, just after she started with me. I've only been with Ray for four weeks, but already can feel an improvement in my performance. It's great to have my schedule planned correctly. And it's taken the guesswork out of each workout and put the fun back in. I found him very encouraging and supportive, and as an older, new runner, this is important in building up my confidence. Really looking forward to the coming years running. Thanks, Ray. Okay, now, so we've talked about the different training intensities, um, or how to, the tools we can use to measure those intensities more so. We haven't, haven't nutted down and, and calculated the intensities, and then I've got information about that within the links, within the resources uh, and the um, handouts. Um, so looking at how to structure the year. Now it could be you're preparing for a half marathon in 12 weeks time, it could be 24 weeks, it could be a full 12 months away. Um, we need to break up that training uh, into different um, phases so that we can build towards getting the best result possible. And in terms of the structure of the periodization, I follow the, the methodology of Jack Daniels. And not to be confused with the Jack Daniels that comes in the bottle, uh, Jack Daniels is a pretty well-regarded and recognized running coach uh, from America. And he's written a, a number of books on the subject and preparing people for various events. Um, he works through four phases, and so do I, starting off with the foundation and injury prevention phase, moving into the early quality phase, then a transition quality before getting to the final quality. And so working through those phases, the first one there, the FI or foundation injury prevention phase, is basically getting the body ready and able to handle the training load that's going to come in the following phases. It's built up of lots of lower intensity running, basically building up the strength of the muscles and tendons, uh, the efficiency of the heart and lungs, lots of lower intensity work. We then move into the early quality phase where we start introducing some higher intensity, some quality uh, workouts, and as well as continuing to build. Uh, actually, I'll just jump through. There it is there. Um, so the duration of sessions, you're building them longer and longer as you're getting fitter and fitter and preparing for what's coming afterwards. Uh, aerobic base building. Um, and like I said, it improves the efficiency of the heart and lungs. As we move into the early quality sessions, continue to build the duration of uh, the long run particularly, but also the base. We also start including hill reps that are going to develop strength. And within the resources and the handout, Got a number of links to a few different hill reps sessions um, of uh, different styles so you can get an idea of the types of sessions I'm referring to here. So those hill rep sessions are going to develop the strength of the legs. I also start um, 
the body getting used to exercising at higher intensities with a little bit of accumulation of lactic acid. But on the jog downhill afterwards, you've got plenty of opportunity to help clear that lactic acid. And the body's going to learn from that and improve and help um, improve the efficiency of everything, uh, all the systems that are getting tested with these training sessions. As we move towards the final quality, we go through transition quality sessions. We continue to build the duration of the, the runs, developing that base building. Uh, we might start introducing some higher intensity work into some of the longer runs, uh, but definitely some threshold work and maybe some VO2 max work uh, within different sessions. Depending on A, what your goal is, what the event's like, um, and where you've come from. So an absolute beginner that's just started training we might not even get um, too much sessions done uh, in this phase at that high quality. Um, but moving from the early quality to through to the final quality, we want to be moving towards preparing the body primarily for the, the longer threshold sessions. Um, and within the final quality phase, that's where we really target threshold intensity because this is where a large portion of a half marathon is going to be run at. Um, it's not going to be purely at the top end of the threshold, uh, particularly for someone targeting a two-hour event. It's going to be at the lower end of the threshold range, um, top end tempo. Um, so we're definitely going to be wanting to spend some time in the threshold just so the body's prepared, can help clear that lactic acid uh, and move, move things on. And so we put some specific intensity sessions into this phase as we get closer and closer to the race. But we also want to taper off, and make sure that when it comes to the event, we're fully rested, fully recovered, and can maximise our performance on race day, rather than turning up to the event tired and fatigued uh, and not able to perform as a result. The structure uh, and format of that periodisation through, through the program, I don't like building programs for more than 24 weeks. 24 weeks is a very long time to stay motivated and stay focused on um, one particular uh, event. So I like breaking a build up into um, periods of, or well, blocks of training of less than 24 weeks total. Now, if an event was 30 weeks away, um, I'd probably try and target an event in 15 weeks time, build up for 15 weeks, uh, and then have another build up for 15 weeks. Uh, doesn't very often, it doesn't happen very often when things work out perfectly, two, two build-ups of 15 weeks each, but it might be 13 of one and 17 for the next. So how do you um, how do you know how many weeks in each phase of training? And this handy dandy chart here that Jack Daniels put together uh, is really the key to it. So if it's a, a 24 week build-up, um, it's, it's pretty obvious that you've spent six weeks in each of the phases. If it's 12 weeks, you spend three weeks in each of those phases. But if it's something not, not easily worked out, um, how do we know how much focus in each phase? Um, for example, if it was only three weeks long, where would you put the focus? And so if we look at this chart and we find the three on it for three weeks, and we notice that um, it's under foundation and injury prevention. Uh, and it's got one, two, three uh, there. So we'd put all three of the training weeks focusing on that foundation injury prevention. That's going to what's going to give us the best opportunity to perform well uh, for the event. But if it was four weeks to the event, you notice that the four is over under final quality and the one, two, three is under foundation injury prevention. So reading that, I put three weeks in foundation and injury prevention training and the fourth week as final quality before the event. Having said that, I don't normally recommend a four-week build-up to a half marathon, uh, especially if you've had very limited training. It might be a, a bridging program of someone who's already done a half marathon or another event. And so we're looking at build, preparing something for four weeks long, moving from whatever they were at before. So they've had a, a complete build-up beforehand uh, as opposed to four weeks only. Um, so expanding that further, if we look at, say, uh, a 19-week build-up, we find the 19 listed under early quality. And you can see the, the phases always go in order, foundation and injury prevention, EQ, TQ, FQ. So that 19-week mark uh, is under EQ, but so is the 18, the 12, the 11, and the 10. 
So that's five weeks of early quality training. And that's going to come for after four weeks of foundation injury prevention training. Uh, so the first four weeks, because uh, uh, everything, there are four weeks less than the 19 under FI. And so there's 21 and 23. We're not getting to those weeks, so we don't need six weeks uh, or five weeks of foundation injury prevention training in that build up. So we go four of foundation injury prevention. We've got the five of the early quality, six of transition quality, because the 16 that TQ goes up to is under the 19. And then for the final quality, we're only going to have four weeks left. Uh, and that's putting together what Jack Daniels, and I agree with him, um, believes is uh, the best combination. So uh, five weeks, sorry, four weeks of foundation injury prevention, then five weeks of early quality, then six weeks of transition quality, then finishing with four weeks just to sharpen things up and get fully ready to go uh, to finish things off. It's quite a complicated chart to understand initially, and I spent a lot of time studying this chart, trying to make head and tail of it. Uh, without much success before I had the light bulb go off one day when that day was but I do remember the the, the light bulb feeling when um, I got the hang of it so if you do have any questions on that chart feel free to uh, drop them in the question box um, or flick us a message later on so some examples of sessions from the foundation injury prevention phase primarily steady and long runs, pace zone three um, and power zone two. Including some stride outs is gonna be really good. Just the neuromuscular programming, that getting a little bit of speed in there. I like throwing in some stride outs in the end of some long runs. And once again, I've got some link to an article I wrote about that uh, in the handout. Um, but also like doing stride outs as a specific standalone session. It's really good for enhancing recovery as well as just having that little bit of speed go into the sessions. But primarily, the bulk of this training for this phase is going to be long uh, and steady. Moving into the early quality phase, we're going to continue with those long and steady runs and pace zone three and power zone two. And they're going to bake up the bulk of the training still. We're going to be making the runs longer, um, building on where we'd got to in the foundation injury prevention phase. But we're also going to include some hill reps and some other quality workouts. We're building the strength that we touched on before. And I've got examples of those, as I said, uh, in the workout section and the handout. As we move into the transition quality phase, um, for some people, I might start including, including long progressive runs. Now, people that haven't ran for two hours solid um, on a consistent basis, I won't get to do these long progressive runs. We'll build up to that two hour mark, and if we need to continue doing so right through the foundation, uh, sorry, right through the final quality phase, then we will. Um, but if someone's got a good base fitness, then we will start including long progressive runs where we start including higher intensities uh, within the longer run. So pace zones three and four, and then finishing with a period of time up at uh, pace zone six. Uh, if we use them in power zones, they align with power zone two, three, and four. Uh, also look at including some fartlek sessions, some Mona fartlek named after Steve Monaghetti, uh, some Don Bosco mountain fartlek. Um, examples of these and details of these sessions are all uh, in the handout as well. But they're just um, some fartlek style interval sessions where you spend a bit of time running at different intensities. As we move on, we'll continue the progressive runs if suitable for the athlete. Um, otherwise, we'll continue with the long, steady runs with some stride outs at the end. Uh, but at this stage of the training, we're going to be including threshold intervals, um, primarily pace zone six uh, or power zone four, depending on what tool you're using to measure your intensity. And that takes us right through, and we taper them off and um, decrease the amount of time uh, on our feet running at any intensity uh, as we move closer to the event. But we don't. I'd say at five by five minute intervals, we might just do um, three reps of five minute thresholds, um, depending on where you're at and what, what you're up to as to what I'll be prescribing. Uh, here's another review. 
from another athlete of mine, Helen, and she says, I've been using Coach Ray slash Quick Kiwi Coaching for a few years now, ever since I decided I wanted to do an Ironman. Ray, has re Ray was really supportive and, and encouraging, and the sessions he put together for me got me to the best physical place for me to achieve my goal. When I got injured, Ray made adjustments to my training so I could keep doing what I could and not go backwards too much. And if life got in the way, he just worked around it. It's been a great collaborative effort with lots of communication, support and encouragement. Any goal you want to achieve, whether it's running 5Ks, biking 20 kilometres, swimming 3 kilometres or doing an Ultraman, Ray will get you there. So that is the end of things. Um, I'll go and answer some questions, work through any questions you have. Um, but I'm going to chuck in a blatant promo here before we get into the question phase. Um, so if you contact me prior to midnight tonight, I'm um, happy to sit down and have a free consultation with you, uh, either by Skype or FaceTime or a phone call if, if you wish, depending on where in the world you are. Uh, Australia, New Zealand, I can do phone calls, no problems. But FaceTime and Skype uh, for other places in the world. And if a Kiwi or an Aussie prefers a FaceTime or a Skype, then that's easily done as well. Uh, further to the free consultation, um, got a couple of options there. Paying month by month, I'll give you your first month of coaching. Uh, at half price, um, or if you want to pay for 12 months in advance, uh, then I'll give you a significant savings off um, that coaching package. Um, but if you're just after a training plan, uh, then I'm going to give you 50% off training plans uh, if you purchase them prior to midnight tonight. And that's uh, by going to coachray.nz slash half hyphen marathon. Uh, and then when you purchase a program, then just type half as a promotion or discount code, and that'll give you a 50% discount. Alrighty, so question time. Um, but feel free to email me. There's my email address there. Uh, if you do want to book a consultation, the link for the training plans and all my contact details down at the bottom there with the website, Facebook, uh, Instagram, uh, Twitter, and Strava. Um, I'm going to fire out another um, quick poll in terms of how many half marathons you have done while we start working on uh, any questions. So feel free to type any questions in, uh, answer the poll, uh, see a few of you have done one or two um, half marathons. Um, some have done lots, I'm quite keen to know how many lots is, uh, what your definition of, and even people doing, uh, planning on their first one coming up. So uh, if you do want to talk in specific details about your situation and how many, um, or how to pr prepare for your particular event, feel free to book one of those consultations. They are obligation free and they are at no cost to you. Just book some time, have a chat about the training. I will get you to go answer, a, a fill in a questionnaire beforehand so that you can, um, so we can streamline and make it as appropriate and as specific as possible for you. But if you have any questions, feel free to type them in the question box. I'm just going to close that poll now. Um, and fire off any questions. Uh, and yeah, I'll spend some time online answering them for you right now. You should be able to grab the handout. Uh, I'm not sure how that works uh, from your end. It's definitely sitting there. Uh, unlike the polls, I can't see a way of uh, sharing that out to you. Um, so hopefully uh, you can grab that nice and easily and download it. It's a PDF uh, with a number of links and different information in terms of the books I mentioned uh, from Jack Daniels and Matt Fitzgerald with the Pace Zone Charts. Uh, but also about power training. Uh, I think that's all the books I mentioned in there. I'm not seeing any questions coming up, um, so if you do have any, feel free to fire away. Um, if you don't have any questions, um, just if you could drop a, a comment in the question box and say uh, no questions or uh, any messages you wish to pass on, and we'll wrap things up. 
and I'm happy to stay online as long as as, as needed to answer any questions you might have. Hey Renee, uh, no dramas about having a chat uh, when you're back to NZ. Um, after Iron Man, that would be perfect. Oh. Yeah, that's no problems at all. Uh, thanks, Rob. Um, that's yeah. Go through the handouts. Any questions? Just flick us a message. Use the um, through Facebook or one of the other methods there. Um, sermon, no problems at all, uh, easily done. So if you guys have got no questions, uh, um, the numbers are starting to drop now, so um, I'll stay on for 60 seconds. And if questions do come in, ha! Love the activity there, Renee. Um, training and listening in. That sounds like it's perfectly timed for you. Okay, with nothing further coming in, um, I will wrap things up. Um, if you do have a question or uh, typing and it doesn't get through before I close things down, feel free to touch base with me directly, uh, either through my website or through Facebook, uh, Instagram. Uh, I'm not on Twitter too much, uh, but I should get a notification if you do send me a, a DM on Twitter. Uh, and Strava uh, is another tool you can follow me and see the workouts I'm doing there. So thanks for attending team, whether it's in the morning, afternoon or evening in the world where you are. Uh, look forward to chatting again in the future.